Um, so I'm Alex. I'm a third year fellow in infectious disease right now. And um, I am mostly doing research now. So um, we do clinical training. And then now I'm doing mostly global health epidemiology work uh, and do a lot with diagnostics and also sort of um, developing diseases or diseases that are emerging and endemic diseases and kind of trying to track and figure out what diagnostics work and how to uh, quantify where they are in the environment and the community. And um, I'm just going to talk about infectious, just broadly about infectious diseases, but without talking about the immune system, that seemed kind of silly. So this is going to be a talk about Im immunology and um, is anybody here? Yes. It is, yeah. It is, okay. Does, does anybody here have like a microbiology background or anything like that? Yeah? Okay. You can help me out then. <laughs> okay. um, all right. So I'll go over kind of briefly about immune system. And, and for this whole talk, I'm trying to keep things broad. Both immunology and infectious diseases often gets really bogged down in like really details, like details about a certain bacteria or some function of the immunology system. And I think that um, ends up being too detailed and we end up missing kind of the, the forest for the trees. And so I'm going to try and keep this broad and use a lot of the terms that you might hear when people are talking about these things and, and try to explain those and the concepts rather than um, having you guys <coughs> focus too much on the details of everything. Uh, so we'll talk about the immune system over overall, kind of different components of what things um, are and then we'll go over how we look at that commonly in the hospital side and also the research side from the lab's perspective, um, just some of the basics, and then using the kind of pathology of the immune system to kind of give us an idea of what happens when um, things go wrong. And then that can be a segue into kind of an overview of infections and how that takes advantage of immune problems or how they affect the immune system. Um, and then if we have time, we can talk about some other things, but I think I'll probably be enough. All right, so the immune system. What is the immune system? This is kind of a really broad topic. Um, the, in general, it's everything to keep, the, everything that our body does to try and keep the inside of our body sterile. And we usually think of our body as being sterile places, and that's not exactly true, right? Because we have a, a gut system, which is this tube, and, and we have to be able to process nutrients and foods and things like that. And so really that's a very unsterile place that's on the inside of our body. And the body has to try and maintain that barrier um, to try and keep things like bacteria and viruses and funguses and all sorts of things out, right? Um, but theoretically, the rest of our body on the inside is, is relatively sterile. The brain is supposed to be a sterile space. We want our blood to be sterile and things like that. And the body's ability to do that is really what is important for a healthy immune system. And that starts with things like the physical bears, and that's skin, which is extremely important, and then the varus bears, and I mentioned the gut as one of the, the main kind of mucous membrane barriers that keeps us from the outside world, but also the blood-brain barrier, also the lungs have a, have a barrier to anything that interacts with the outside world, basically. Um, and then you'll hear different ways that the immune system is kind of classified, and I think the, the actual um, categories or remembering all the categories is, is less important, but it's more important to just think about like what they are and what they're trying to classify and it kind of gives you an example of how the immune system works. So there is the innate, sorry, in, innate immunity system and then there's the adaptive immunity. And innate immunity is sort of this like immediate inborn response that our body has. And so the, here there's this graph on the timeline on the bottom, right? So this is supposed to be your immediate response in the first few hours of anything coming into contact with you. <coughs> this is your body's ability to defend against it. And so the first thing, you have a microbe that comes and then you have your various physical barriers, your skin, et cetera, that will defend against that. And then if they make it past that, then there's various cells called phagocytes or neutrophils or things like that that will essentially immediately identify those as being foreign objects and try to uh, take care of them. And they usually do that by uh, by eating them, so we call that phagocytosis. <coughs> and there's this whole group of cells that do that. Um, and then there's various cells that will essentially assist in that function. And then after that kind of immediate phase, you move into this adaptive immunity response. Um, and s that tends to be not just delayed, but a more specific response that's mediated by things, primarily 
of what we think of as uh, lymphocytes, B and T cells. Um, and this kind of delayed immune response is much stronger and also much more targeted, whereas this is, will eat up anything like dirt or whatever that comes, comes in. This is something that will only work against, say, one specific virus or one specific thing. And it usually is a response that happens after it's seen uh, a previous pathogen. Um, so that's innate versus adaptive. And then another way that we often classify things is either by humoral response or cell-mediated response. And this is more thinking about kind of the delayed response now, so the, that humoral or the uh, adaptive component. Um, so in this kind of figure, this is a virus that infects a mouse, right? Um, and once the virus gets into the body of the mouse, then you have these B cells, which is part of that um, adaptive response, and they secrete antibodies. And these antibodies do various things, but essentially they activate, they either coat the virus or help uh, deactivate, inactivate the, uh, the virus in some way, and then either other cells will come and eat up the virus or destroy it or something along those lines. And this is called humoral response because this is um, what we consider, like, I guess, things that float around in the body in this kind of mysterious way, like humors, um, which is a very vague term. Um, but it's, it's the difference, that, or the flip side is something that's cell-mediated, meaning like a cell is doing something where it's going to directly phagocytize phagocyto is something. Um, in this sense, this is cells are secreting things that float around in the bloodstream and do things. So antibodies, cytokines, um, immunoglobulins, all those things, anything that's secreted and floating around and not a cell itself kind of fits into this humoral response. And then the other side is the cell mediated side. So again, this is just the cells are directly doing something where they, like for instance here, it's a T cell is directly attacking this infected cell and then it destroys the cell. So that's cell-mediated response. Um, so if we go back here again, it's this kind of innate response, which is the cells will directly go eat something. That's a quicker response. And then this more directed, delayed response, which is these lymphocytes that will secrete things uh, to go and attack whatever pathogens there are. So that's kind of the two main ways that things are So all of these cells kind of fall into this white blood cells category um, for the most part, minus like your skin and all of that. And this is what we usually mean when we talk about the immune system is the white blood cells. And another term for that is leukocytes. And these are the mainstay of our immune system. They're produced in bone marrow and they live in this other system which is called the lymphatic system essentially. And this is similar in concept to like the blood system, right? They kind of are in parallel, the entire lymphatic drainage is in, par is in parallel to our blood system. It's kind of like the sewage pipes of our, of our blood. And white blood cells will, will essentially live there, will take uh, things that they process and put it into the lymphatic system and it gets filtered out in the spleen. And so some of the other important parts of the lymphatic system there's a thymus, which is kind of a, a when you're maturing, uh, when you're growing up, the thymus helps to produce and mature T cells. This is important as an immune organ. Uh, lymph nodes that you'll hear about, things that get swollen when you're infected, these are kind of like these little nodes that kind of are different areas. These are just like stoppage points in the lymphatic system. So the reason they get swollen when you're in sick is that you get more uh, immune cells that are kind of congregating there when they're fighting an infection. Um, and then the spleen, so at the end of all this, all this gets filtered to the spleen and the spleen will take it out and remove it. And so you can get an enlarged spleen if there's a whole lot of this debris and things like that or infection that's going on and, and the spleen can't handle it and it will get enlarged. There's various reasons that, that happens, but. So when there's problems of this system, so again, white blood cells and most of your cells are produced in bone marrow. If there's a problem in the bone marrow part, then that's what generates a leukemia. So leukemia is a white blood cell problems that are originate in the bone marrow. And then if you have a problem in the lymphatic system where you have uh, white blood cell issues, then that's what we call a lymphoma, essentially. So 
they can be the same cells, white blood cells, um, and they can, uh, with a similar problem in terms of like there's too many of them, there's too little of them, or something along those lines. But a blood cancer affecting a white blood cell population that is either in the bone marrow or in the lymphatic system, that's sort of the, the main differentiation between leukemia and lymphoma. Does that make sense? Okay. So if we break down these white blood cells, these leukocytes, there's many different types, right? So there's neutrophils, there's eosinophils, lymphocytes, basophils, and monocytes. And these are kind of the, the main categories. Neutrophils, they all have a very specific um, function within the immune system, whether it's adaptive or uh, innate or humoral or, or whatever, but they all do different things. And different types of infections that they're more uh, geared towards protecting us against. So neutrophils make up the bulk of all of our white blood cells, and they, they tend to be the initial response, so they're that kind of phagocytosing cell. And they respond to almost all infections. They're involved in most things because they're that first line of defense. Um, so eosinophils are generally more, spe more specific to allergic reactions and parasites. Lymphocytes, those are the T cells and the B cells, and those tend to be involved in viral infections, things that take a longer time, um, a delayed specific response. So if you've seen a pathogen again, they're the ones that give you the immune kind of defense against it. That's what we use for vaccines, is we're using B cell memory cells. Um, and then basophils and monocytes have other specific functions that are less relevant, but basophils are kind of re responsible for a lot of our histamine release and allergic responses. Um, and the monocytes are these large phagocytosing cells that live in the barriers that we have, like the gut or whatever, to kind of help with the skin, help skin with kind of defending against pathogens that come through. Um, I'll talk more about these, but it's kind of the main overview. And when we look at labs, when we get a white blood cell count from like our CBC, our basic blood draws, it's something we get every, everywhere. This is, WBC is sort of all of these together, right? So they'll essentially aggregate all these, look how many there are, and count them, and then they'll give you a number, right? And that can be either high, low, or whatever, based on kind of a reference range of what most people are supposed, supposed to have. And then they can further break it down into a differential, right? So they'll do a differential. This can be done various ways, but essentially it's a um, they'll look at what percentage of the white blood cells are made up of all of these. And again, these are things that we know how much there should be. There should be about 50% neutrophils in, in normal blood, 40 to 60%. And lymphocytes should make 20 to 40%. And so based on if those are elevated or low, we can tell a lot about what's going on in the kind of body's immune response to something. Um, Um, it's, it's very little. I think it's about, I think they will only need about two cc's or something like that, or one cc. Um, the, the, yeah. It, for anything, if you're checking for anemia, like blood levels, anything like that, they'll usually get this too. Um, the differential they won't always do, because this often means somebody has to look at it under a slide, um, although there's a lot of automated things. This is, again, just kind of a breakdown of a table of these same cells, um, but just wanted to point out like that there's a different percentage of each of these. So neutrophils are the most pop most common, so 60% approximately. These things like basophils, which are the histamine response, are very little, 0.4%, so there's not a lot of those. They're not needed, really, um, for most common things. And then um, they target different things. So neutrophils, primary response for bacteria, fungal infections. Eosinophils are more, much more prominent in parasitic infections or allergies. So these things you can look up, um, but essentially to say that they're different. And then they all last a different amount of time in the body too. So the neutrophils, which do that kind of immediate response, just last a few days. And then the B cells, the memory cells, can last years and years in our body, and that's how we have a memory, is because they still, even though I was infected with something five years ago, it's still here to defend, help defend against something if it sees it again. So that's um, important. Uh, so a little bit more details about all these. So neutrophils, again, these are, this is the innate cell-mediated immunity. 
most abundant. They're the first responders. They don't live a long time. And they, are, they mostly work by eating other cells. Eosinophils, again, they mostly are against parasites and allergic responses. And they're a small percentage of the overall um, white blood cell count. And lymphocytes, this is sort of the other big class besides neutrophils. And this is generally differentiated into T cells and B cells. Um, and the T cells tend to be what we consider helper cells. And they will help the B cells do what they're supposed to do. The B cells secrete the antibodies and be pre become the memory cells um, that are important for kind of longer term defenses. And there's T cells are broken up into these, uh, you often see like CD4 or CD8 or something like that. And that's based on a protein in their cell membrane. Um, and it's just a way for us to further differentiate what a T cell is, and this is important because certain types of infections will affect certain classes. Like HIV affects primarily CD4 cells, and it works because it's able to target that receptor, or HIV is able to target that receptor and know which cells to infect. Um, and so when you get a problem, or when you have HIV, or you have a problem that affects a certain type of cell, then the, the immune problems that you get, or the immune deficiency you get, is specific to that cell deficiency, essentially. And so the CD4 T cells um, are the, the main helper cells, and they, they assist the B cells in doing everything to, uh, from antibody secretion to cytokine, cytokine secretion, um, all these things that are really important for kind of our longer-term defense. Um, and then the memory cells, again, are a B cell class that is what we take advantage of for vaccines. And so antibodies, it's the, the kind of floating around in the blood and um, provide a lot of our kind of prolonged immunity or more specific immunity. They're broken into many different types of antibodies, but these are, uh, there's a couple of main classes, and you'll see these a lot in diagnostics because we take advantage of these to kind of look for a prior exposure, right? So oftentimes in research we're looking, we're trying to think about, oh, has somebody had, um, something before, like malaria, or somebody had typhoid, or uh, coxie, or anything, right? If we had, they had it before. And the only reason we can tell is not because we, we can't look for that bug in their body anymore, because it's gone, right? It's been gone for years. And so what we're really taking advantage of is, are there any floating antibodies or any B cells that have seen this disease before? And if they have, then we know that they've been exposed, right? That's the only way. Or they've been vaccinated, right? So they've in some way seen this before. Otherwise, they wouldn't have that antibody in their body. Um, and so there's the different classes of antibodies. There's IgM, um, which is the pri primarily an early response. So this is early in infection, what we often call it acute, um, an acute antibody. So if somebody has an IgM to a, um, some sort of bacteria or pathogen, a virus, then that we tend to think of that as like the acute phase. So they're actively infected or much earlier on. And then at some point, that switches to an IgG. Um, so the, there's, a, there's a, a point when B cells start to secrete IgG instead of IgM. Um, and the IgG is the main antibody for secondary response. So this is what vaccines kind of do. This is the, a stronger, more robust response. And then there's these other two that you'll see less often, uh, IgA, which is a mucosal response uh, antibody, and IgE, which is more of like an allergic, uh, allergic response antibody. So this kind of triggers the most of like the major ana like uh, allergic reactions, like anaphylaxis or something like that, is caused by IgE. Um, but the two main that you'll see for diagnostic purposes are IgM and IgG. Um, and so here's an example. This is hepatitis A. Um, so here on the bottom we have weeks. So this is weeks from exposure to the virus. And um, these bars kind of show what happens. So if you're infected on day zero, you have virus in your blood for the first five weeks or so. And then you're symptomatic, not initially, but after about two weeks or so after getting the infection, you'll be symptomatic, right? Um, and then you're the, this kind of red thing is liver enzyme, so this is just showing what the damage is to your liver by the virus. So this kind of goes up and peaks around four weeks or so, kind of early on before your body's doing anything to defend itself because it doesn't know anything about hepatitis A. 
and then this purple line is the IgM. So this is the acute response that your body has. So now you've been viremic for a little while, for about a week, and you, you start to mount this response that's an IgM mediated one. So this goes up and it peaks around four weeks and it starts to plummet. And so by week 12 or 13, it's already started to come down. And that's because your body's now making IgG. So this is kind of that delayed response. And this will start to go up and then you'll see they kind of cross over around week eight or so. And this is the main response. And this, you'll notice the viremia starts to, to downtrend once IgG starts to come up. And if we draw that out a little bit in terms of time frame, so this is just kind of expanding. This is now over the course of a year. Um, this is the IgG bar. You'll see it goes up, and then it will kind of slowly come down, but it will essentially plateau out. So even years after infection with hepatitis A, you can check somebody, and their hepatitis A IgG will be elevated. And that shows you that they've either been vaccinated or they've had the disease before. Meanwhile, IgM, which was really high in that first time period, goes all the way down and essentially becomes zero again, or n not detectable. And so um, based on this, if I checked your IgG and your IgM level for hepatitis A at one year, your IgG would be positive and your IgM would be negative. And that would tell me this is an old infection. If you checked it at month one or month two, your IgM would be positive and your IgG would either be negative or positive depending on where it is. But the fact that the IgM is positive means it's an acute or recent infection. Um, and so we take advantage of this for a lot of different infections. It's not you know, always true, but it's the kind of rule of thumb. So you talked a little bit about the seven years out you could test? You can for some, for some infections. It depends on like some viruses. For like hepatitis A, you, you would be able to tell 10, 20 years. Um, zo like chicken pox, zoster, things like that. A lot, most viral infections you can tell for, for years and years. It just depends on the state of the, um, how good our diagnostic is. And so for a lot of infections, our immune response is not such a robust one. So we can get reinfected again in a couple of years or, and in that sense, the IgG wouldn't be detectable. But for the most part, even, even for most infections that you become immune to, your IgG would become elevated for, for life. Yeah. And also why we need boosters. Why we need boosters, right, right exactly. Take papers off and things. Yeah. Like the IgG is too low to be effective. That's right, yeah. Can you tell when you need a booster by looking You could, yeah. Um, well, so the, the reason that, like a lot of the, that the schedules for vaccines, like zero month, three months, six months for hepatitis B or whatever, um, the reason they've chosen those intervals is because during the initial testing, they look at, let's say, 1,000 people, and 600 of those people by three months, the level was dropping, and so they needed a booster at that point. And so rather than testing everybody to, get a, to figure out when they needed a second shot, they, they sort of say, okay, at this point, most people need the shot, so you should get the shot. But you could do it that way where you test it. Um, again, it depends on the, the, the bug, but you could do it that way. Usually, so usually it's an antigen. It's either like the antigen, it's like the like hepatitis A itself, or some component of hepatitis A that's really specific, like some part of the cell membrane or something like that. Or so right, exactly. That would be. So it's still the same, even without the IgG. There's the IgM, IgG. Um, yeah. Or will it straight away go to IgG? It, it on the booster, it should just be IgG. On the initial one, it will be an IgM response. So it's yeah. only only with initial, yeah, exactly. So this is sort of the um, kind of an IgG graph, although it doesn't say so. Uh, but the idea here is this is a graph to show what happened on the second exposure. And so if this is your initial response to hepatitis A, then your first response is kind of um, lousy and takes time to happen. And the second time you get it, because your body's seen it before and those B cells are primed, th these B, essentially these B cells that do nothing but fight hepatitis A now float around in your body and sit there for years or will continue to kind of at a low level reproduce, but es essentially they'll just stay there. And the next time you get hepatitis A, you'll get this much stronger, much quicker response that keeps hepatitis A from causing you any problems at all. 
Um, and when this happens, the, the cell line of B cells that remember hepatitis A also goes up. So if you were to get re exposed all the time, then you would have really high levels of these B cells because your body knows it needs more of these to defend. And that's the same idea of, of a booster is maybe there was only like 10 of these B cells in your body the first time and you get a booster and now it's 100 or now, now it's 1,000 or whatever it is. Um, your body has seen it more and so it knows to keep more of those around to do this response. It's not always clear. It depends, again, on, like, hepatitis B is a little bit trickier. Um, or like, they do the test here. Oh, yeah. And it's like, you were sick. I was like, no, I got Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I would say most, most infections, it's hard to tell. Well, so most things that you can vaccinate for, you can't, it's hard to tell if it was a vaccination or if you had the disease. Um, like chicken pox or hepatitis or whatever, right? Like if we had it as a kid or we got vaccinated, you would just see the IgG. Um, for TB, TB is a lot, is a really tricky thing diagnostically. Oh, and, and it's like one of the most complicated or most confusing diagnostics. Um, Did you do the second larger response, yes. the extra antibodies that are floating around? Do they find them close to the joint and they don't. They use, they, they're not, they're, I'm trying to think of if, if there are, um, there are some diseases where that, so the idea is that these antibodies that float around are really specific, right? So they would only bind hepatitis A or they would only bind TB or whatever it is. There are situations where that probably um, is not entirely true. Like dengue, for instance, is a virus and after you get infected with dengue or chikungunya or something like that. And they, sometimes people will get these very long, like six month to a year um, arthritis or arthrosis and things like that, where the thought is that something after the infection and your immune system are, are not entirely correct. And so maybe something about the dengue virus is similar enough to your body where some of your immune response is actually affecting your body. Um, and so I, I think probably there is a chance that that happens. Um, but it, for, for the most part, that doesn't happen, like 95% of the infections that we know about. Um, okay, so that's most of the white blood cells. The last two are basophils and monocytes, which again are, are usually not that relevant. Most clinicians would never even look at them. Um, but basophils are involved in histamine release. Um, and you'll, another one you'll hear about is mast cells, and these are all just re involved in allergic responses. The reason we take antihistamines for allergies is because basophils and mast cells release histamine. Um, but does that affect a lot of like your dermatology reactions with allergic yes. And again, this is essentially to what your body, it's a response that your body's having to something that it considers foreign. That's not like a bacteria, right? And that, that's why it's releasing histamine to create an inflammatory response that your body's gonna respond to. Um, it, like the histamine and things like that is a signaler that calls like neutrophils and other things to go to that area to do something against pollen or whatever it is. Um, yeah. And Monocytes, again, are just kind of these really large kind of uh, cells that eat other cells and they live in the gut and other areas where um, other areas of, that are barriers and will prov provide like a physical defense against other things. And so going back to this lab, um, if we look at white blood cells that get broken down into the different areas. Another one that you'll common see, commonly see is bands, and people will use this uh, as, a, as another indicator to help point towards a certain type of infection. So, so bands are essentially immature neutrophils. And so remember, b neutrophils last from hours to a couple of days, so they're relatively short-lived. Um, but most of the neutrophils in your body, so there's always some production of new neutrophils, but most of the neutrophils in your body are already circulating and alive 
there's some proportion that are going to be new and some proportion that are going to be old. And the idea here is that, oh, sorry, um, this is from uh, bone marrow. There's various stages of development, and band is sort of the last one before neutrophil. And here we see 2% are, are bands. Um, the idea is if this increases, then you have an idea that something is going on in the body where you're making more band, making more neutrophil, or your body's responding to something and, and revving up neutrophil production, and so it, uh, in order to respond to some sort of infection or threat. Um, is that an elevated number? Two is not. not. Two is not. Anything under five is thought to be normal, but sometimes you'll see 20 or 30 percent or something like that, right? And that's grossly elevated. And that might make somebody, even if they they look relatively well, you, you it might be impending. Like you might think there's an impending serious infection that's gonna gonna happen. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a second. But so common abnormalities that happen with these. So with general elevated white count, this is the whole group of white cells. We call that leukocytosis, and this is kind of like the most common lab abnormality in the, in the hospital. And this can be, this is super nonspecific. This is like anything in your immune system is going, is doing something, right? So it's very vague. But the most common causes are some sort of infection, um, a cancer of some type, a stress response. So even if you've just been running um, or you're really, you've been working really late, not sleeping well, you can get an, a very transient elevation in your white count. Um, and then drug reaction or an allergy of some sort, essentially, because all those are involved in the, those white blood cells, right? Um, and so within the infection group, there is elevations of different types of cells, and that helps people think about, okay, like if this is an infection, if your white count is due to an infection, which is what most people assume, then what kind of infection is it? And if it's neutrophils that are increased, most people will assume this is a bacterial infection because that's your kind of nonspecific initial response and bacterial infections are the most common types of infections, right? So if you, based on those two things, if you have an increase in white cells and it's mostly neutrophils, people will think it's a bacterial infection. Um, something that kind of also points in that way is those bands. If those bands are increased, it suggests a really severe infection, so much that your bone marrow is revving up production of neutrophils, and it also suggests usually that it's a bacterial infection. If you get a lymphocyte increase, um, so anything cytosis is elevation in that, right? So if you get a lymphocytosis, that's the B or T cells, then people will think that that's generally a viral infection because those are the delayed response uh, reactions. Those are the things that are like a neutrophil can't just go eat a, a virus, really. And so a lymphocyte predominant increase in white cells suggests a viral infection of some sort. And then in eosinophilia, so an increase in the eosinophils, uh, which is that parasite or allergic response, tends to suggest it's a parasitic infection. Um, for cancers, um, the, sorry, it, it's even more nonspecific, I guess, but generally speaking, most cancers are actually not in the bone, they're not affecting the white blood cells, right? Like if you have a, um, what we often call like a solid cancer, so a breast cancer or lung cancer or something like that. Those are problems of a certain type of cell, like breast tissue cell that's reproducing a lot, right? That's like breast cancer. Or lung cancer is lung tissue or lung skin tissue that's reproducing too much, right? And, but those don't actually involve your immune system. So your immune, your white blood cell count might be totally normal. Um, but if you have a lymphoma or leukemia, then you can get really high elevations in your white cell count, but you might not be infected at all. Um, and so that's the kind of a, the most common elevation, elevated white blood cell count due to cancers. Um, you can also see if you have a problem in your bone marrow, and that's where all your cells are being made, you can start to see a lot of those bands or a lot of immature cells, like everything before the bands, like promyelocytes, myelocytes, things like that, you'll start to see those circulating in your blood, even though they shouldn't be there yet. And, and that might suggest that there's a cancer. Um, those cell lines that aren't that common, the monocytes and the basophils, if those are really elevated, that's really uh, worrisome for a cancer because generally speaking, there's not a lot of things that make our body produce a lot of those other than some problem going on in the bone marrow. Um, if, you start, if you see 
a problem with white blood cells with other cell lines, so like red blood cells or platelets, other things that are made in the bone marrow, if those are also kind of wacky, then that might suggest that this isn't just an infection, this is actually something going on in the bone marrow. Um, and so in, those, in that sense, these can be really helpful in help targeting those things. So stress I kind of talked about, and then um, again, drug reactions. <laughs> eosinophils, like if, if somebody has a rash and they've been taking a new drug and you're not sure, sometimes you might see a, an elevation of their eosinophils or their basophils and that might suggest, okay, this is actually a drug reaction, not, um, you know, poison oak or something like that. Although, I, maybe that's a bad example. <laughs> anyway. Um, so what happens when these various things go wrong? So the, okay. So Going back to like skin and how important that is, this is like extremely important. And one illustration is in burn patients. So when people lose their skin layers because of burns or other reasons, they become highly susceptible to bacterial infections. And this tends to be the, the main cause of death in burn patients. This is why we have burn units. Um, it's not necessarily because burn units um, have more surgeons or anything like that or need to be people to be intubated or anything like that. We have all those facilities everywhere else. The main reason is to keep the infection risk low and to, because we have nurses that are trained at taking care of the skin and providing kind of like um, either creams or wraps or whatever it is to essentially try to prevent this infection. So that's the main reason we have burn units is to try and provide this secondary layer of, of uh, protection. And just to go over some of the terms again, you often hear these things uh, like bacteremia. And so bacteremia means blood, bacteria in the blood. Anything emia means in the blood. So like anemia is like a lack of red cells. Um, and so you'll hear bacteremia or septicemia or whatever it is. And that basically means some sort of infection in the bloodstream itself. And then you'll hear things like sepsis. Uh, which is often on this continuum of sepsis and shock. And sepsis basically is implying that there's an infection and that it's a severe infection. That sort of people use it kind of loosely, but the, the actual definition is that there's some sort of severe life-threatening organ dysfunction that's been caused by an infection. Um, and usually these are all related. Most sepsis is bacteremia, um, but not necessarily. And then you often hear this term shock, which is thrown around a lot. Shock basically means hypotension um, that's uh, causing end organ dysfunction, multiple organ dysfunction. And that can be anything from losing a lot of blood. So if you have no blood, then you get hypotensive and you have shock. Um, or it can be endocrine related. If you have a large stress response or something like that, you can develop shock and have decreased blood perfusion. Um, or your heart stops working after a massive heart attack, whatever it is, shock is really vague. But if it's because of an infection, because of bacteremia or whatever, then it becomes septic shock. So septic implies that it's an infectious thing that's more severe. Um, and bacteremia is a specific way to define where bacteria are. Does that make sense? Okay. Or like viremia would be virus active in the blood or something like that. Uh, or fungemia. So that was skin barriers. <laughs> so HIV, going back to that, because it's a good, good example of when a very specific part of the immune system is not working. So HIV primarily affects the CD4 T cell line. Um, and people will think, OK, HIV, especially when they come to the hospital, uh, they're just higher infectious risk. It's like a generalized risk or whatever it is. And that's not exactly true. It's actually really specific, because we know exactly what the immune system problem is. They're not just going to uh, be at higher risk for all infections or at higher risk for certain types of infections. And these T cells are helper T cells, and they're particularly important for intracellular bacteria or pathogens of the type. So these are neutrophils that have these um, various dots in them. And so these are neutrophils that have actually eaten uh, Neisseria. So these are the Neisseria gonorrhea bacteria. And so after they eat them, neutrophils will it, like essentially kill them inside the, the cell, right? It will lyse them using lysis and various things. And the T cells help the neutrophils able to do this. Um, and without them, these 
bacteria can actually survive fine in the neutrophils. They're adapted to survive within cells. So you don't see a lot of them out in the, in the bloodstream in general or out in the, like, the serum. Most of them survive within the cells, and they can reproduce there and affect other cells in that sense. So without T cells, these will just survive in the body, and they can reproduce and cause a serious infection. So that's kind of the, one of the main purposes of these helper cells. So all the major infections with HIV are involving intracellular organisms. So for bacteria, it's things like mycobacteria, which is like tuberculosis, uh, Neisseria, so gonorrhea, salmonella, which is diarrheal um, uh, bacteria, various viruses, herpes, uh, zoster, like chickenpox, cytomegalovirus, all these things. Toxoplasmosis, which is uh, a parasitic infection that affects the brain, is almost exclusively in the HIV population because our immune system is able to just kind of harbor it, take care of it for the most part. Um, but because of this deficiency, people, you get horrible life-threatening infections come through it. And same with fungal infections that you almost only see in HIV patients because of this deficiency. Um, and this isn't a, again, like a generic random thing. This is a very predictable response. So this is sort of the various diseases you, that you see over time with HIV infection. Um, so this goes from in acute infection to 13 years. And then here on the y-axis is CD4 count. So normal CD4 is over 1,000. And um, you'll see it's broken up through 200, 500, and 1,000. And this is for every HIV patient that's being taken care of, you get a CD4 count to know where they are on the spectrum every time they come to the, to the office. Um, and you'll see that these are the various things that people will get during different phases, but these are almost all non-infectious things, right? So they'll get arthralgias, they'll feel tired, they'll get, they're at higher risk for kind of autoimmune issues, um, like Guillain-Barre or Reiter's, and then these are like gingivitis and skin conditions and things like that, and that happens even the CD4 starts to decrease. And then once you start to get below 200, this is when all the, the really serious infections happen. So all the things I mentioned on the other side, PCP, toxoplasmosis, whatever it is, um, all happens after the 200. And so we define AIDS as when your CD4 is less than 200, or if you see any of these infections, because functionally you're acting like somebody who has low CD4 count. So if you come to the hospital and you're, you have HIV, but your CD4 is 1,000 or 800 or 500, you're like anybody else who walks through that door. If you have a CD4 of 50, then you automatically are at risk. Like you know you're thinking about these things um, because that person's immune system is not working. Um, and most death due to, HIV, it's due to AIDS is from infection, um, and that almost exclusively happens under this. And these, this is so predictable that this is like the clinical algorithm for when we treat people prophylactically, so when we treat them before they have the disease. Um, so if your CD4 is less than 200, then you get put on Bactrim to prevent this. Once it's less than 100, you get put on this to prevent Toxo. Essentially, it's very predictable. All right, next. Uh, so again, cancers. So cancers are another really good um, illustration of our immune system, both because they cause specific problems, but also because the chemotherapeutics we use target specific things in the immune system. Um, and so even though we often think of like all cancers as being somewhat similar and being in like a higher risk of infection, at least is like we think about in the hospital a lot, that's not really true. So the main differentiation from an infectious disease standpoint is whether they're solid or liquid. And liquid being the hematologic malignancies, so the ones we've been talking about, leukemia or lymphoma, and everything else is essentially a solid tumor, so a solid cancer, so prostate, bone, whatever it is. These are problems of that specific type of tissue that's not uh, white blood cells. And in terms of infectious risk, these are solid cancers are generally thought of as low risk, almost like they don't have cancer from an infection standpoint. And when you talk about leukemias and lymphomas, these people are at higher risk than in AIDS patients. So they're, uh, or they can be. So they're thought about completely differently and their infectious risk is completely different. Um, so we talked about this a little bit. So solid cancers don't directly affect the immune system and that's why that they're um, not 
higher infectious risk. If they are at risk, it's because of chemotherapy they're on that affects something. Um, they can cause direct local damage. So if you have a colon cancer that is eroding into your gut wall, and then that becomes a portal of entry for bacteria. So there's certain types of bacteria that live in your guts. And if you get bacteremic from it, if, you, if we see it in your blood, and we didn't know you had colon cancer, we do a colonoscopy because there's no reason that bug should be in your blood unless you had something wrong with that, that barrier. Um, and so in that sense, solid cancers can cause certain types of infection risk, but they're not like kind of generalized. Um, and then in, of course, if they get a transplant or something like that, then they're at different risks. Um, and then for the leukemia and lymphomas, it's because of a functional problem with the white counts. And because that's the problem, chemotherapeutics are even more problematic because they're targeting your bone marrow and trans like bone marrow transplants and things like that are essentially trying to get rid of your immune system and replaces them with foreign immune system and so that creates its own immune thing. This is why they're at such high risk. Um, and looking at the kind of infection risk during an acute phase of leukemia, the your normal neutrophil count is somewhere in the 2,500 to 5,000 range, or actually it's up to, I'd say, 7,500 range. So these are all abnormally low, right? And so this is the x-axis, the lower amount of neutrophils, and then this is risk of infection. And even though all these patients have acute leukemia, the real risk is directly related to how many neutrophils you have. Um, and so if you have no neutrophils, which is often the case, you're at extremely high risk, and so you get put on an antibiotic even if you don't have signs of it. So chemotherapy and how that increases your risk, this is also kind of dependent on what the chemotherapy <coughs> is. But the general idea is that chemotherapy works by killing the, trying to stop cells that are rapidly producing, those are generally cancer cells, um, from surviving. And then if those cells are your white blood cells, if that's the problem like in a leukemia or lymphoma, then the chemotherapy is gonna kill those cells. And if that happens, then you're at higher risk for infection. That's how most chemotherapy works. So a lot of chemotherapeutics have side effects that involve your white blood cells that are not, that's not like the main purpose of it, but because most chemotherapeutics are not so specific, it can't really differentiate as well. It just generally stops all cells from reproducing. Anything that is really quick will be hurt more, but it's not, it's like a very broad kind of And another thing that chemotherapy does is it can create leukocytes so that when we're talking about skin defects in burn patients, people will develop um, things similar to that when they're on chemotherapeutics or if they're, uh, they're post-transplant because of immune defects. So people will develop severe mucositis and have essentially no barrier in their mouth or in their guts or on their skin from the outside world. So they become similar to burn patients in terms of their infection risk. Okay, and then beyond chemotherapy, there's also lots of other drugs that cause immune problems, and that's how they work. And one broad class are biologics, which are essentially monoclonal antib antibodies. These are like designer drugs. This is sort of like all the, um, I don't know what we call it, specific, uh, I don't know, like the really specific targeted thing, like things that's precision medicine, anyway. Yeah, like, you know, all the buzzwords is, is generally around things like this, or biologics. These are things made in the lab that are monoclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies made to target this cell or to target this bacteria or whatever it is. It's an antibody that was made in a lab. Um, and they're really effective. Um, but generally speaking, these can, or they often target uh, like a cancer cell, but that cancer cell happens to look just like every other cell, right? And so they can cr uh, create major problems. Um, they're usually used for cancer or autoimmune diseases. You can tell what they are often because of their name. They'll end in MAB for the most part, and that's like monoclonal antibody. That's the reason they're named MAB anyway. And then SEPT, um, which is another just way that biologics are often named. And they do different things. So they can target the cell directly. They can target 
um, the things that float around, like the antibodies or uh, cytokines or things like that, like TNF and um, others. And these can cause a lot of problems, basically. And so whenever you're, um, sorry, going back to biologics, they're really potent. And so there's some biologics that people call like liquid HIV because you give it to them and it targets the T cells. So it does exactly what HIV does, but you've, you're doing it in a drug. And this is great for whatever disease it has because the T cell was a problem, but it also means it depletes the T cells and you are at all the same risk that an HIV patient might be. And that's an extreme example, but the idea is that some of these really effective medicines that we have for treating disease also can cause severe immunosuppression. Um, there's some more general ones other that you'll hear a lot about, and steroids is probably the main one, and this is things like prednisone or whatever that we take for various reasons. Um, but these kind of broadly dampen the immune system and can put you at increased risk for various infections. Um, yeah. And, okay, that's the, that's my immune system. <laughs> Questions or thoughts or other parts? Okay. Do you guys want to take? Oh, yeah. Can you mention stress as one of the causes of the immune uh, response? So mm -hmm. immune system response? Yes. How, how does that do? How is, do they set off stress or? The, it's, um, there's a variety of different reasons. The, it's thought to do two things. One is actually rev up like production of certain cells. And uh, the other is that a lot of what we see, like neutrophils aren't, aren't always just floating around the bloodstream. They're often um, what we call like marginalized. So they, they hang out at the side of the, blood cell, of the blood vessel or something like that. And so when we test your blood, we don't see them because they're not when you're drawing it, you're not seeing them. And so when we have stress, re like a, st a major stress, if you're really stressed out from working or not sleeping, or if you're running like a lot or doing some sort of heavy activity, your body's endocrine system is reacting differently, right? There's, you have a cortisol boost, you have all sorts of various things that are happening. Um, and these cause those neutrophils that are hanging out on the side to kind of go into the bloodstream and also causes your body to produce more of them. Um, and it's partially thought that this is kind of like a, a defensive thing. So if you're not sleeping well and you're not eating well and you have a high level of stress, it's sort of like a temporary boost to prevent you from getting other infections. I mean, this is oftentimes what like when you do start to get your rest, then you get sick, right? Like you've been stressed out for a month and then all of a sudden you're like recovering and things like that. And that's because like your body's been so revved up that like when you're actually resting, those, those cells are you know, only lasting it for a few days and it can't produce any more and it kind of tam tampers down and, and all the things that you've been doing that have put you at increased risk of getting an infection are still there and then um, your body kind of just, <laughs> I don't know, succumbs, I guess. But. Yeah. 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 It. They should. Well, the problem is that with autoimmune diseases, they're really hard to diagnose, and so the the and when like, I guess most diagnostics work really well if it's a truly foreign thing, right? If if it's a worm that you have, then you it's really easy to make a medicine that targets it, or to look for like a worm part. Right, like that's much easier to detect in a lab, even though we don't have the best diagnostics for worms. But <laughs> anyway, the idea is that like you, you, it would be easier to tell that it's different, right? And an autoimmune disease, it's really tricky because it's your own cells that are producing something that is abnormal, but um, like abnormally targeting your own body. But it's kind of hard to tell exactly what it's doing, um, and so the diagnostics are much more vague. Um, so they often involve like your own cells DNA floating around in blood, right? And that's not normal. Like you shouldn't have so much of this part of your DNA floating around in blood. So maybe that's a marker of an autoimmune process, right? And so they're not usually IgG or IgM because your body shouldn't be making IgG to your own body, right? So 
um, they, they can't be done in the same way. Um, theoretically, if it was like a totally foreign thing, I mean, I, yeah, I guess for autoimmune, you wouldn't really have an IgG response, so it would just be different. Um, and I, I think this is an often overlooked thing, and I think hard to tell in the research setting, which is that the majority of diagnostics that are lab-based aren't perfect, right? They, um, even if the IgG is positive, like for dengue, for instance, dengue looks just like chikungunya, which looks just like Zika, right? So in IgG to dengue, for somebody who's lived in California their whole life and never left, you know, the Bay Area, like probably doesn't mean that that per person's ever had dengue. It's probably cross-reactivity with something else, right? Because it's not a perfect test. And I think that's not like clear to a lot of people. Um, and, and for other things like Lyme disease, for instance, like the diagnostics are just not super good. And so you're using a lot of different assumptions. And if you're not symptomatic with it, then we would say you don't have it or something along those lines, right? So it's like a combination of things. It's not a perfect test. Like, um, for other things like HIV, it's like a very good test now, right? But 10 years ago, it wasn't so. And um, so that, like whether or not IgG is there or IgM or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean um, what we want it to mean. Yeah. The somebody who's allergic to dust was never exposed to dust when he was a kid, or yeah, I think that it's <laughs> it's not like his mom was a crazy person. It's not. It's not. <laughs> it's, I I don't know the full answer. I think that there's a lot of like prevailing theories. Uh, one of which is this. Um, shoot, I forget what's called. It's like the, the idea that you aren't exposed to things when you're young, right? Or um, there's a lot of studies tying allergies to like C-sections um, versus vaginal deliveries or something like that because you see so many more pathogens on your way out if you're born vaginally, right? And so this is like this concept of um, people in developed countries, like we're this ultra clean society that we don't see a lot of pathogens. We're not eating dirt. We're not seeing like all these things that we otherwise might have been 50 years ago or something like that, right? And um, so if the body hasn't been exposed to them, then it, when it does see them, it thinks of it kind of like a bacteria, right? Like it's like a totally foreign sub, like op something that's come, and the body's response to it is really dramatic, right? Rather than saying, oh, I've, I've seen this bacteria or this you know, peanut or whatever it is like a thousand times before, and it's not a problem, or my response to it is very little, right? And so um, the idea of desensitization, which is sort of this idea that you can expose people to small amounts, is to say that you're, is essentially to get people used to something. Um, and there's various ways that you can do it and the way the body responds to it is different, but it's, the idea is if you've seen, if you see just a tiny little bit, then your body's response to it can't be that dramatic, right? And if it gets it again a week later, then the response might be a little bit more, but it's like not as alarmed as the first time it saw it. And if it sees it again, then it's gonna be even less alarmed. Yeah, the, a kid's immune response generally is much weaker, and everything is new, and so that's good and bad. The, the good is that they can get infections and things, and um, because most of actually our symptoms are because of our immune response, like fevers are our body fighting off things, right? Like, um, and so they can get infections and not be that sick. Um, and that's good because it's seeing everything is new to a kid, right? And so that's good for them. But the bad thing is then they can harbor viruses and then they, you know, that's why like daycare centers and everybody who's a parent have, who gets sick every other week, right? Because they're, they're not fighting off these things. Whereas if we saw like, you know, RSV or something like that, there's a really good chance that we would just fight it off before we even brought it home, right? So it's sort of like this adaptive response, I think, like evolutionarily, but it does mean that kids, um, carry a lot of things and have a, have a weaker immune response, um, but it's, it's good for them in the future because they see a lot of things.
Yeah, I'm not sure. I think that that has to do with the way our cells age and um, some of the memory cells or whatever it is that's seeing certain pathogens will just be either like dysfunctional or less responsive. I'm not sure because they tend to be certain types of allergies too. I, I don't really know. Matt Baker would be a good person to ask when he talks yeah. about room. <laughs> Um, I don't, I, I don't, I, I would imagine it has to do with, um, yeah, pulmonary, it, s smoke does a lot of things to the immune system, um, and my guess is that it both it damages the epithelial cells of the of the lung, and then it probably also dampens the immune system. So your ability to respond to a pathogen the way, or to something the way you would normally, it's like if you've never been exposed to something, kind of, because your immune system is not responding to it. And so my guess is that some what related, and it's you're being treated like you're, um, I don't know, had never seen it before, and so you develop an allergy. I'm not sure. I'm kind of making that up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, I wouldn't say they're very common. They're, they're common. They're certainly common enough. Uh, they happen, we see them relatively frequently. Um, but, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily problematic in the most day-to-day -day thing, right? Um, generally, the more problematic are the, the less common. It's really, it varies a lot by disease. So some diseases you, you need to be on an immunosuppressive forever, um, whether it's steroids or others. And other ones, you can be on it for a month and you're, you get through a phase of like when it's acutely worse and then you can be off of it. Um, so it varies a lot depending on the disease. And then in terms of the infectious risk, there's not very good studies. There's certain studies that, that show if you're on a higher dose for a longer period of time, you're at much higher risk for certain infections, um, and then you would take a prophylactic antibiotic if that's true. Um, there's certain like cutoffs that are a little bit arbitrary. The research is not like super robust. So um, generally, if somebody's on it for years, they would probably be on an antibiotic, but a lot of people are, most people are not on high dose steroids for years. They're, it would be like a really low dose of it. Um, kind of like maintenance dose or something like that. And then in that sense, they wouldn't need to be on any sort of prophylactic. So it just varies a little bit. But. Okay. Why don't we do? Oh, sorry. I think generally the like that list that showed you like the normal counts, um, that's like a normal count. And if there's abnormally shaped or sized cells, that usually means they're immature of some some sort, and they usually won't list them because they're not common. But if they start to list them, um, th like if that if that list suddenly doubles in length. <laughs> Like that, that what happens, and then and then you realize something else is weird is happening, um, and generally, unless it's like a really acute, severe infection, it usually means it's not an infection, or at least it's not just an infection. Um, but these are all like really vague, like generalizations. Like you, it, it depends on the case and the, the person. Um, yeah, I think it would just be an indicator that something else is going on in the bone marrow, probably. Um, that's not just like a pure infection. I mean, a lot of infections also affect the bone marrow, which is makes it more tricky. 
yeah, I don't know if that helps. It, it's, it becomes really complicated really quickly. And so there's some generalizations that you can make that most people do, but then uh, it's easy to step outside of that. We, at that point, usually after transplant, um, we're giving medicines to stimulate the bone marrow and they're on antibiotics to protect their, their body. And um, it, any cells that are being made is good <laughs> at that point because they're supposed to be populating your body with cells and there's no cells there. So it should be revved up and making things. So abnormal. we know there's a problem in the bone marrow, so it's not problematic. I, I would expect that there's all sorts of weird shaped cells in there. Um, yeah, yeah, but there, there's no like good sign or bad sign or something like that, I guess, just in terms of shape and size. But I wouldn't normally f worry too much about shape and size, I guess. Um, okay. do, do you guys want to talk about infection? Or do you guys want to break? Or Quick break? Quick break? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. So he's going to talk about, so we've talked about immune system, we're going to talk about infection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's very simple here. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Welcome. <laughs
So now switching to infections. Um, and again, this, this often is like a giant list of bacteria and things like that. And I think that's less helpful than just sort of being broader. And so I, I was just going to talk about kind of categories of infections and how they affect the human or the body and cause disease, and then just sort of different classifications within that. And so many types of infections, kind of the main types of pathogens that uh, cause problems are bacterial, viral, fungal, and then various parasites, and that's broken down and usually into protozoan or worms, um, and then plus or minus prion disease, um, which is, I'm not going to talk too much about. But so the, the first kind of most common type of infection is bacterial, and these are usually single-celled prokaryotes, and they can cause disease in a number of different ways. And so most, there's bacteria everywhere, right? There's millions and millions of types of bacteria, and there's kind of pathogenic and non-pathogenic bacteria. And so that, that basically means a bacteria that can cause disease and a bacteria that can't cause or doesn't cause disease. And um, that distinction is, is sort of vague because for the most part, if you put a bacteria where it's not supposed to be, it can cause, this, cause problems. Um, and most pathogenic bacteria, the reason they're pathogenic is that they are adapted in some way that they can get into our body or survive in our body. Um, and because of that, they are causing problems. Um, and so the ways that these bacteria are adapted in to doing that is they can produce exotoxins, and then that's basically a bacteria that's secreting something, and that secretion, that toxin, causes those problems. So a lot of diarrheas are toxin-producing bacteria. So they're not getting into our body, but they're producing a, a toxin that our body is not liking, and then we, we responding to that by trying to flush it out. I mean, it's not exactly right, but anyway, flushing it out is good. So, But the toxin is creating the problem there, rather than the bacteria so much. Um, and then there's things called endotoxins, and that's basically something that is a part of the cell wall of the bacteria, and then that is causing the problem itself. Our body is responding to that uh, part of the cell wall. It knows that this is foreign, but the response to it is more dramatic than it should be, and, and we call those endotoxins. Um, and then it can also cause problems by doing direct like physical damage. This is less common, but if you think about like um, a bacteria that gets into the body and ends up in the bone and infecting the bone, it's gonna slowly eat away at the bone, or if it's in a blood vessel, it will slowly eat away at the blood vessel and then can actually cause problems that way. Um, and it's adapted to survive or be able to latch onto your bone or blood vessel or whatever it is, um, but that's the, the main way that it causes problems. And then there's indirect ways, and this is generally saying that the body's response to the bacteria or something that the bacteria is doing is uh, more is stronger than it should be and then causing problems. Um, so there's the kind of various ways that bacteria cause issues. Um, so obviously examples of bacteria, Staphylococcus is kind of like the Staph aureus that you hear about a lot, MRSA, blah, blah, blah. Um, Helicobacter, which is, uh, I think that's what this bacteria is, I'm not sure. <laughs> and um, which has been known to cause, it's been linked to cancer, right? H. pylori in the stomach. So it's adapted to live in the stomach and the body's con uh, continual infl inflammatory state trying to fight off this infection essentially over time creates cancer. And so that's how bacteria can cause cancer. Uh, HPV and things like that are similar. HPV is not a virus, or not a bacteria, but the idea is the same. And then the various uh, and then various other things, like syphilis is a treponema, and that's a bacteria. Rickettsia or other kind of tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease is a bacteria. Salmonella, et cetera, a huge long list. Um, and then there's viral infections. So viral infections are generally um, basically a DNA or RNA strain that's protected by a coat. This is like two examples of um, viruses. This is essentially the DNA, and it's protected in some way. And it then tries to take advantage of, it doesn't have any cell machinery itself, and so it reproduces by taking over a cell's immune or machinery. And then, so it will invade a cell and then take over its protein making um, components, et cetera, et cetera, to reproduce essentially. Um, and so they 
essentially are very good at hiding because they hide inside of your own cells, right? And so they, they become very hard to target. The body is, doesn't really recognize them as well. Um, and this is like hepatitis, herpes, human papilloma, all these other things generally have the word virus in the name, but not always. Um, and then fungal infections. So these are much more rare. You don't hear about these as much, but they're, they're still common. Um, fungal infections are just like you would imagine. They're like the moles and the funguses that we see out in the world, but they essentially are getting into our body. Right? So like this is an electron microscope of aspergillus, I think. And um, it looks kind of like a plant, right? And that's what it literally is. And so you can see this is uh, a culture of, um, I think, candida essentially, but it looks like a plant. Again, it's branching and it grows out in this way. And then these uh, various hyphae and things like that will break off and they become sp spores and reproduce that way. Um, and so they be behave versus like a bacteria, which is a cell that produces things and floats around. And the funguses essentially grow in kind of plant-like ways, right? And so they uh, behave very differently and cause different clinical problems. Um, they're generally much larger than bacteria, so 10 to 20 times larger. Um, and they, yeah, tend to be more rooted, I guess. Then there's different types of protozoan parasites. These include things like malaria, plasmodium, and then toxoplasma, which we're talking about for HIV, and things like giardia, which causes diarrhea. It's kind of a, a, a smaller list, but they can cause a lot of different diseases. These are single cell, like essentially like animals. They're like almost like they um, are doing their own thing versus um, a fungal infection, which is just like um, but they're mobile, they lack a cell <coughs> wall. Um, anyway, they, they cause disease in that way. Um, and then worms, which is its own different group of things like <laughs> round worms and um, tapeworms and things like that. Um, these are uh, ascaris in an intestine. But they're large. You can see them with your naked eye. For the most part, people will find these doing colonoscopies unintentionally. Um, <laughs> they produce eggs. They're just like you would imagine worms are, but they've somehow gotten into your body either because you've consumed their eggs or um, some of them burrow through your skin or whatever it is. Right? And so that's worms. And then just really briefly, prions, which people, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm just curious. Most people <laughs> don't have worms. Most people don't have worms. They, they cause, <laughs> they, <laughs> most people in the U.S. don't have worms. <laughs> um, the, they, they can cause people to feel like fatigued or they can cause nutritional deficiencies or be anemic. Um, a lot of times people will have worms and they, like if it's just like a few worms, it really doesn't necessarily cause any problems it's not necessarily problematic. It's, if you get a huge burden, then it can cause uh, bloating or discomfort or pain. Um, for people who, like kids, if they're developing, it can cause a lot of problems like uh, because of the nutritional deficiencies and uh, anemias and things like that that it, it's related to. Uh, so you worry about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, I, I <laughs> don't know that this is a human intestine. I, okay. you know, just grabbed this from Google. Uh, I have no idea, but I mean, th oftentimes they, um, especially in high burden areas, like uh, worms are super common, and they, and there's more severe forms, especially with ascaris, one of its more severe forms is that can cause perforation of the belly, and so if we get this many worms, you can get blockages of food, um, the, you can actually get essentially rupture of the intestine. They go to surgery emergently and then they cut out this whole section. Um, you wouldn't otherwise treat it this way. These are, because these are such a different organism than humans, you can take pills that you don't have to absorb systematically because they're only living, in this case, they're only living in the intestine. And you can have really good medicines that you take once or twice and you can clean out these worms, um, paralyze them without causing us any trouble. 
Um, I've, I've heard of things like that, but they, I, I generally hear about them when they don't go well, <laughs> um, which does happen more than it should. Um, I don't think that's probably the best strategy, but, um, I mean, it causes a lot more problems, I think, than would be ideal, but, um, and so, like, the, the way that we would get them, or most people get them in, like, most kids get these in developing countries because the eggs are in soil and things like that, and people will play in the soil, and, um, and it's really hard to be super clean about that, right? And so people will consume the eggs, and then they'll um, reproduce in, in areas. This is in areas where there is a high burden. In the southeast, there used to be huge amounts of various worms, and, and because of various public health campaigns to deworm people and try to get the burden low, we, we now rarely see this in the U.S. When we do get it, it's usually not ascaris or this type of worm, but we do get other kinds of flukes and tapeworms, and that's generally from undercooked meats uh, or fish, like sushis and things like that. Um, yeah, and, and pork and fish and things like that can cause or carry a lot of fish also. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's, that's the main way people can get it. So like a lot of people, we, we had a case of somebody from New York who had had like this really fancy sushi and had a, had a fluke from that. So <laughs> not to discourage anybody, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> anyway. Um, prions, sometimes people will kind of classify into the infection category because they carry the same traits as infections. And prion diseases, so prions are proteins that are abnormally folded. So this is, let's say, um, the folding structure of a normal protein. If, if it were misshapen in a certain way, it, you, it would be considered a prion, I guess. Um, but it's not just this. It's that if this comes in contact with another protein, another normal protein, it causes it to misshape. And so in that way, it's considered infective and it can spread. Um, and I don't know that much more than that, but this is the whole group of diseases um, that are called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies because they generally affect nervous system tissue. And this includes things like mad cow disease um, and Kreutzfeldt-Jakob, which is kind of like a more common form of mad cow, essentially. There's been a lot of studies recently, I think, are linking multiple system atrophy and some other like um, degenerative diseases. Might Some of those might be in this class also. Anyway, that's just a quick aside about prions. Um, okay, now going back to bacteria. So this is sort of like, a, like the, how a lot of bacteria are often classified, right? And so there's so many different bacteria, people need to kind of figure out how to classify them. And then the most common way is to separate them by whether or not they're gram positive or gram negative. And the, all of these different classifications are not that important and you don't need to know them, but the idea is just like why do we use these and why is this the way bacteria is classified? And the reason is because this is the way that labs have traditionally identified or be able to distinguish between a staph and a pseudomonas, right? If you just are trying to grow it in the lab, how are you gonna tell if it's one or the other, right? You're, you can't just look at it under the microscope and see what the shape looks like. Um, because that's really complicated. So you try to take advantage of different attributes of the bacteria, right? And that is in some ways useful for us clinically or thinking about like what the bacteria does. But for the most part, these are, are somewhat arbitrary lab things. Um, so the, the biggest classification is this gram positiveness. And that's, I'll talk a little bit more about, but basically it's staining the bacteria and based on whether or not it stains or retains the stain, then that separates groups of bacteria into gram positive or gram negative. That's the main classification that you'll see. Um, after that, then you get kind of shape-based um, classifications based on how like things start to grow on a plate, at, like colonies and things like that, or what the bacteria look like. Sorry, not, not how they grow, but what they look like under the microscope when you stain them. 
they generally take the shape of either like circles or spheres or called cocci, and then rods, which are called bacilli. And then that's kind of like the main next classification. There's kind of some other ones, but um, I guess spirochetes you'll hear about for syphilis mainly, but it's kind of this spiral corkshoe or corkscrew kind of appearance. And then after that, after you, you stained it and you get a shape, then you look at different types of enzymes that the bacteria produce. Um, and these generally are like if you give it some sort of a nutrient or um, something, whatever, other growth media, something like that, it either does something or it doesn't do something. And based on that, you can differentiate between bacteria. So that's here it's lactose fermenting or non-lactose fermenting, right? And you can see that in the lab. And so you'd be based on that, you can decide if it's E. coli or pseudomonas, right? Um, and so based on this kind of algorithm, you can work your way down. And sometimes some of these are, um, have some clinical significance. For instance, for differentiating between different strep species, you look at how it hemolyzes blood. Um, and that actually is part of the mechanism that strep has to be invasive and cause disease in humans um, is related to the way it hemolyzes things. Um, so it's, yeah, not that important that you obviously know all these things, but this is sort of the reason that we, we do this classification system. Um, so going back to the kind of the gram positive versus gram negative, because that is uh, relevant and a good example of a lot of different cell properties or bacterial properties. And so the bacterial cell wall is usually made up of uh, peptidoglycans. And these are kind of these sugars um, that provide a barrier for the cell, right? And so um, if you have a cell wall, this is a cell membrane, and then these peptidoglycans are kind of like stacked on top of each other to provide this physical barrier um, and prevent kind of foreign substances from killing the bacteria, right? Um, and you can either have it where it's just cell membrane and a bunch of these peptidoglycan uh, layers, or you can have other things on it. So this is a cell membrane with two layers of peptidoglycans and then a second outer layer that has various uh, fats and things like that in it, right? And the gram stain, uh, essentially takes advantage of the different makeup of these cell walls. So a gram-positive cell wall is primarily peptidoglycans. It could be stacks and stacks of these. Here it's three, but it can be many uh, layers of it. And it's mostly peptidoglycans. And a gram-negative cell wall, it's a uh, very thin layer of these peptidoglycans. And um, what this what the stain does is essentially it stains those, that peptidoglycan. So if you put a stain on it and it stay, and then you wash it and it stays there, then it, it stays this purple color and then that become, that's a gram positive bacteria. Um, if you put the stain on, but there's not a lot of peptidoglycan and so when you wash it, it just comes right off, it, it becomes this pinkish color and that's a gram negative bacteria. Um, but this actually has like significance because the cell wall uh, it actually de determines a lot of like what we use for antibiotics and a lot of what causes disease and, and or how it causes disease. Um, so in gram negatives that have this extra layer outer membrane, they contain something called a um, LPS or lipopolysaccharide. Anyway, it's this lipid on the cell membrane, but this is essentially an endotoxin um, that the body reacts to in a very kind of strong inflammatory way, exaggerated way, and that causes a lot of problems. So clinically, if you were to get a gram-positive bacteria in your blood or a gram-negative bacteria in your blood, the gram-negative bacteria, you're more likely to have a strong response initially to the gram-negative. You, you, your body will recognize it as foreign much, I guess, much stronger, um, which isn't good in this situation. This is a, a, a toxic response. And so a gram-negative bacteremia is more likely to lead to septic shock or something very uh, maladaptive and acute versus a gram-positive bacteria in your blood. Not to say that one is ultimately worse or better than the other. It's just that if somebody gets infected and then six hours later they're hypertensive and in shock, it's more likely to be gram-negative. And that's because of this endotoxin. Um, and then... Antibiotics also take advantage of this. And so penicillins being kind of the prototypical antibiotic, um, 
is a beta-lactam antibiotic. It's sort of this class of antibiotics, and things are either beta-lactams or they're not. So they're either penicillin-like or they're not. That's how we generally classify antibiotics. And this works on this peptidoglycan wall. Um, and because of that, it's really effective against gram-positive bacteria. So penicillin gram po or uh, beta-lactams are really great for gram-positive and by far the best that we have. And the way it works, more or less, is it essentially keeps this glycan wall, this multiple layers, from cross-linking, and so you get breaks in the wall. And based on that, because of this break, then um, the cell can't protect its membrane and then will essentially <coughs> lyse itself, or more antibiotic can get into it, um, some variation of that. Um, and so for gram positives, if you can, if it's sensitive to penicillin, that's by far the best, the best drug for it. And the resistance, just really briefly about resistance, um, develops because, so for, for most antibiotics, they work in different ways. So they have to generally get into the cell or destroy the wall. And so they'll go in, to, they'll get, take it up into the cell or find their way in. Um, and then they tar usually will target some sort of like crucial function within the, the uh, bacteria, right? Um, and so the antibiotic, or the bacteria will develop various ways to get rid of it. So we can either decrease how much is getting taken in by the bacteria uh, by changing the way the cell membrane is, by changing the pores, by doing something um, that's decreasing the amount that's coming in. Um, or it can increase the amount that's getting kicked out. Um, it can inactivate the antibiotic once it's in the body or once it's in the cell, uh, in the bacteria. Um, and it can also kind of modify its own <coughs> internal structure so that the antibiotic isn't effective against it anymore kind of the, the general ideas. Um, and the, the bigger picture about how resistance develops is that, so if you have a lot of bacteria, just based on various uh, variations in bacteria, there are often are like a few that are resistant, that might be resistant to your antibiotic, but most of them might be sensitive. So if you give a drug, then the idea is you'll kill off most of the bacteria that aren't resistant to it, but then you get a few that remain that are uh, resistant, right? Because those are the one, only ones that survive. And then those ones that survive will reproduce and then become the, the predominant colony, right? And so a lot of the, the thinking of like, if you are supposed to take seven days of an antibiotic, you should take all seven days. And the idea is that these aren't entirely resistant. They're just resistant. They're partially resistant. And so the idea is to hopefully kill them off as well. And you don't get a re repopulation based on those. Um, it's not clear if that's entirely true. But anyway, that's the idea behind um, and so based on that, the idea is also that if you take antibiotics repeatedly, then you're putting yourself at increased risk for this um, and that you will develop drug resistance in your own bacteria. Um, that's not always how you get resistance, though. Um, a lot of people will get drug resistant bacteria having never taken antibiotics. And the reason that is is because bacteria can give their drug resistance to other bacteria. They can share them on plasmids or other things like that. And, um, and the resistance is not always one antibiotic specific. So it, some a bacteria that has a resistance or a resistance gene to penicillin might also carry resistance to another class of antibiotic. And so because I've given myself penicillin, I've now developed resistance to another drug also. Or my bacteria was hanging out with somebody else's bacteria on a surface somewhere and then they shared their resistance genes. And then I walked by and touched that and then now I have this resistant bacteria. And so in various ways, bacteria can share their resistance and we can get them in different ways. Um, and that's where you would get like your newly acquired MRSA? Yes. Because if, if somebody else resistant, you picked up. Exactly, yeah, okay. that's the idea. And I think, um, like community-acquired MRSA, for instance, is like less relevant now because MRSA used to be rare uh, in the community and like people didn't believe it existed because they thought you'd have to be at the hospital or having gotten a lot of antibiotics. Now it's probably 20% of the community staff or is. Right. Yeah, exactly, so it's everywhere, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, you know, I probably have it all over my skin. Yeah. Um, but it's not, you know, it's just, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it's everywhere, right? Like these resistances increase increasingly predominant. And like cattle and things like that that get a lot of antibiotics, 
the bacteria they have, their E. coli might not be the ones that cause us disease, but those E. coli are developing resistance that they can share with other bacteria that do cause us disease. Um, and so in that way, antibiotics being used somewhere else are going to be probably the cause of problems <laughs> or are causing these problems. Um, the ways that we get infections, so again, like inf pathogens only cause problems if they get into our body. There's lots of different ways to classify this and they're not that um, necessarily important. There's, this is one classification scheme which is separating by direct transmission or indirect transmission. And that can be contacts so with skin to skin, it can be sexual contact or body fluids, <coughs> um, environmental, so if like you step on a worm and it burrows through your skin, that kind of like direct contact. Droplets, you're inhaling a bacteria into your lungs and it's getting into your lungs. Um, versus things that are um, like environmental and just uh, there and are not necessarily like being I don't know, that you're getting from other things, right? So th this can be things that are airborne. These can be things that you like touch on the surface. Those are called fomites. So they're just bacteria that are lying around on a surface. We call those fomites. Things that are, exist in food or water, um, things that are contaminated essentially. Those are just examples of indirect ones. And vector borns are anything that's carried by an insect. Um, but other ways to classify it, so things that are fecal oral, so things like uh, infections that are secreted in fecal matter and then you get because you eat them. Obviously they can span lots of things. They're both direct and indirect. So again, the classifications aren't so important so much as just thinking about like each pathogen and how you might get it. Um, other lists essentially, but basically saying foodborne, waterborne, vectorborne, aerosolized, airborne, placental, perinatal, postpartum, all sorts of different things different ways that infections can be spread. Um, but they're very specific, right? So knowing how hepatitis B is spread is important um, for hepatitis B. And then some healthcare-related infectious terms that you'll often hear. So healthcare-associated infections, nosocomial, which is essentially saying the same thing, an infection that originated in the hospital. Um, and this can happen for a lot of different reasons, whether it's an infection that you use too much antibiotic and you develop resistance to it. Um, and sorry, people take a lot of antibiotics in the hospital, bugs become resistant, they exist on surfaces and then people pass them around and then that's how people get an infection. Um, you get an increased concentration of these rare infections like pseudomonal infections are thought to be hospital acquired mostly because they're rare in the environment but in hospitals they like are the perfect environment and Everybody who has pseudomonas goes to the hospitals and then they bring them and they just live around there. So it's a concentration of kind of rare bugs. Um, and a lot of the things that we use, like surgical equipment, uh, ORs, whatever it is, there are areas that are ripe for in certain types of infections to live, like Legionella lives in water systems. And so um, anyway, there, there's, it's just an accumulation of lots of different things. And then I think most importantly, or very importantly is that people who are in hospitals are, are sick, right? And so their immune systems are weaker and so they're much more susceptible. We were just talking about whether doctors are at increased risk for getting infections even though they're exposed. They're probably at some increased risk for some things like RSV, the same things that like parents are probably susceptible for at daycare centers. But for things like MRSA or Pseudomonas or all these other infections that you often hear about at hospital acquired, they're less likely to be uh, at risk because their immune systems are fine and they don't have cuts. and they're not stepping on nails or <coughs> getting bitten by sharks or whatever it is that causes these infections, right? So, or it just had surgery and have an open wound, right? So those are how people get healthcare associated infections. Um, yeah, and so invasive procedures and line, like central lines and uh, IVs and things like that are just, they're portals of entry, right? They bypass your skin. Um, they, if they're not, if, yeah, they can get dirty really easily. They're being manipulated all the time, things like that. So you'll hear about a lot. Um, and so I guess, again, this is just looking at, there's reservoirs of infection in the world, whether or not they're in people, in animals, or just in the environment. And then you have some sort of an infectious agent, and then you can get them in different ways, whether it's bug-borne bug, bug or food or whatever, and then they get to a person, 
And whether or not the person gets it depends on their immune system, depends on where they get it. If it's just a mosquito, but it doesn't bite you, obviously you're not gonna get it, right? Or if, you, if it's something in the um, worms in the soil, but you're wearing shoes, you're not gonna get the worms. Um, so it has to be the right exposure and the right host. And then based on the host's <coughs> immune system, they'll either get symptomatic or they will recover from it or be asymptomatic or they could die from it depending on their immune system, right? And then that also modulates whether or not they become a reservoir or give it to other people. If their immune system's not working, they have an infection for a long time, they're viremic, then they're more likely to spre spread it than if their immune system was super good. Um, and so we often think about like uh, an epidemiologic triangle of these things and um, where you have the infectious agent that all has their own unique properties, how it infects people and how it gets to them and with the host, which is a mix of immune system with other types of things like um, genetics, age, socioeconomics, other things that modulate whether or not the host is gonna get sick from the agent and then environmental things which um, involve essentially whether or not a pathogen exists somewhere. So if you live, you know, if we live here, it's easy for me to say you probably don't have worms and that's because of, there's not a lot of worms in the environment here anymore. Um, whereas 100 years ago in Tennessee, that wasn't true, right? And so I think things like that or the spread of Lyme disease or malaria or dengue or whatever is largely environmentally determined. Um, okay, and that's mostly what I had. <laughs> Uh, questions? Sorry. <laughs> Not a lot of specifics about any individual disease, but. of immune system genetics and environmental exposure. It depends on what it is. Most of them, I think, probably are endocrine related in some way. Um, like for instance, some, some inf like s for some of those infections, they might be, uh, have a gender preference up until menopause. And then after menopause, there's no more gender dif uh, difference. Or for some of them, they're, like valley fever or coxy is much more predominantly male, and that's probably partially genetic, but part of that might be because they're, um, they, the coxy is something that's environmental in the dirt in the valley and affects farm workers or, or people who are in prisons. And farm workers and people who are in prison are more likely to be men, right? So that like some of those gender disparities are based on genetics, some of them are based on endocrine issues, and some of them are based on environmental exposure risks. Yeah. Um, so also definitely true. I mean, I think that's, I think it's often unclear from research that exists whether or not a gender difference is true or if there is one or not, or have, has anybody even looked? You know, a lot of, there's not a lot of research in a lot of infections, especially more common ones, right? So um, I think disparities research is, is lacking um, and infectious disease research for a lot of these things is probably not there yet either, so. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it probably matters that much. I mean, I think if you were uh, a newborn and a germaphobe, then I would say it matters. But I think as like a formed adult, <laughs> probably not a big deal. Uh, probably helping. But so, I mean, I'm fine with, as I've gotten older, I yeah. feel like I get sick really fast. And I can yeah. think back to watching a lot of the bad shows. And that was before the internet. Yeah. I think... Um, I think being a germaphobe overall is probably better than not being a germaphobe. <laughs> Just from, I mean, I think a, a good example is like people who are born overseas and then live in the U.S. for some period of time and then go home, right? They uh, grew up in an environment that wasn't as sterile as the U.S. and as clean and a lot more generally infections that are circulating. And then they'll come here and then they, their immune system drops, right? Or it, it 
it's not as responsive to a lot of those things because they're not being exposed to them anymore. And then you go back and you think you're still in that environment, or you, you've seen all this, you've had it all before, it's fine. And then you go back and you get sick with diarrhea and all these other things that you used to get all the time, but your body was fine with. Um, so being a germaphobe in that situation would be, I mean, generally how we should all think about it, right? Like if you're exposed to something for the first time, which is what most of us are um, getting sick from, then that would be better, right? Like being clean and um, reducing exposures to pathogens and things like that. But also why it's important to let little kids play in the dirt. Yeah. And yeah. be exposed Probably. to the dog. Like there's a big obviously a bigger movement to get organic. popular to let those things happen and I don't know years yeah. ago parents were probably saying don't don't do that my kid needs to be clean and they shouldn't be doing that but now they're seeing that it's okay a natural immune system having a day and there's been a big movement yeah. in the parental world to let I think the allergy trends are really striking yes actually those are too yeah. any other questions that you guys have okay. thanks sure. yeah. Sure, of course. So, um, my daughter 